saying this to you, there's certain things you do well. You, me, anybody. The more we can do of that which we do well, the more successful we're going to be. Welcome to Worth Quoting, a program sponsored by the Open Campus at Florida Community College at Jacksonville. I'm Carol Spalding Minor, your host, and today we have with us Dr. Ulafi Saxon, author, lecturer, and trainer and consultant, primarily looking at things like personality. Welcome. We're glad to have you. Thank you. I know that you've written a book called Working Together that talks about the Myers Briggs, and now you've written a new one with entrepreneurs. Why did you write the one on entrepreneurs? Basically because that's what the editors wanted. <laughs> um, the first book was a book that was sort of how to use the whole notion of style and temperament. Uh, and we've had some good success with it. And in this day and age, the whole notion of people being entrepreneurial is becoming more and more important, simply because companies are downsizing, right-sizing, and losing employees, so people are very uh, very much in need of trying to figure out what to do on their own. And so the reason we wrote this book is to provide people who want to venture out on their own with some tools so they hopefully can eliminate uh, mistakes that they might otherwise do. What so that's a purpose. What kind of tools? What kind of tools would they have? Well, what it, as I sort of indicated to you earlier, um, the whole notion of the work that we're doing is based upon the work of Carl Gustav Jung, the Swiss psychologist, and uh, for many, many years there's been an instrument available here in America called the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator, which actually first was used in 1944, and last year more than 3 million people answered 120-some questions, and through answering these questions you get a lot of information about yourself and how you tend to function. And that whole notion has been brought very much into the world of business, and it allows people to do what they're really good at as opposed to trying to fix what they're really bad at. And that's very much what the book is all about. So all entrepreneurs, can, can all types be an entrepreneur? Absolutely. Uh, we sort of talk about four different types of entrepreneurs. And you could basically say that some entrepreneurs have a lot of foresight, while other entrepreneurs are much more operational. And there's not any one way to be an entrepreneur. And one of the fun things we've done in this particular uh, text is we've interviewed about 20 people who have done very well as entrepreneurs. And of course, what the whole world is looking for is sort of a golden key, i.e. there's one way you become an entrepreneur, and we certainly learned otherwise. So what this text allows you to understand is basically what kind of an entrepreneur are you likely to be and how are you likely to function. Mm -hmm. And can other people who are not entrepreneurs benefit from reading the book? Yes, uh, they can benefit from it if you use the concept of entrepreneurship, i.e. people working in organizations uh, can learn and understand how they will function at their best. Well, we can talk a little bit about some of those personality traits and, and those kinds of things because even if you're in an organization, you're gonna have to work with other people they might be people who are, that you're buying things from. Uh, outsourcing is mm -hmm. another way of, mm -hmm. of dealing with mm -hmm. that. What are some of these personality types and how do they function? Well, you basically have, uh, and this is the work of David Kersey, who is a professor emeritus from the uh, University of California. But he took the whole concept because the Jungian ideas are based upon 16 different types. And what David Kersey did, he reduced it to four different temperaments. And the temperaments is one of being an intuitive thinker or an intuitive feeler. So those are the two intu intuitive pieces. And then the other two temperaments is you can be a, sen a sensing judicious person or you can be a sensing perceptive person. So what you have then is that you have two types of people who are intuitors. One is a thinker and the other is a feeler. And then you have two types of people who are sensing, 
and one is judicious and the other is perceptive. And each one of these people will, on an everyday basis, function very differently and very predictably. So that if you say you're downsizing and you're going to now rely upon outsourcing, even in a large organization, to know who you deal with is, is, is uh, I mean, you just short, you, you, you shorten the distance in understanding people, and that's what this is all about. Okay, so you're supposed to know yourself and you're supposed to be able to figure out the other person? Well, if you know yourself, then you can build on what you're most comfortable with. Uh, you know, as I've explained before, one of the things that bothers me, uh, being a lone Norwegian in America, is this whole notion of the performance evaluation. Mm -hmm. And you know, when people do a performance evaluation, inevitably, they tend to focus on the things they don't do so well. And uh, my contention is that nobody is really a star performer in areas they don't like. So what this instrument allows you to do is to focus on where you're good and where you have a real opportunity to perform. And then where you're not a good performer, you can augment that with people who have those strengths. In other words, it builds on your strength and it takes away the notion that you had to fix your weaknesses. Mm -hmm. How, what's the difference between a sensor and an intuitive? How would you typify that? A sensor is on Earth, and an intuitive is on Space Patrol. Uh -oh. If you said that, you know, in a very popularized form, here is what you can say. The sensor is concrete, specific, likes to deal with the here and the now, and be very involved in the day-to-day -day kinds of things that are going on. An intuitive is not concrete. An intuitive is a very abstract person so that if you deal with an intuitive individual, they have tremendous capacities to be conceptual, to think about the future or have ideas. Feelings are not emotions. And it's very important to understand, if you say somebody is a feeler, the notion is that they're wish worship that's not the point. A feeler is driven by values, the good, the bad, the right, the wrong, the likes, the dislike. A feeler is a person who doesn't take rejection very well, whereas a thinker is far more logical. So that if you take an intuitive thinker, it's a person who tends to be very strategic. If you take an intuitive feeler, it's a person who tends to be very idealistic. And they will function very different as entrepreneurs. The feeler obviously is warm, people, focused, and all that sort of stuff. Whereas a thinking intuitive person is far more analytical and far more into driving the business as opposed to being people-oriented. But what they have in common and what they share in common is their intuition. I'll put it another way for you. Intuitive people live in the future. Sensing people live now. So now if you go back to your first question, if you're an entrepreneur, it's pretty obvious then that an intuitive entrepreneur will be very different from a sensing entrepreneur. And one of the things that we say when we work with organization is that all the conditions are present for people to be the way they are. And no conditions are present for them to be anything else. So that if you take, you know, we've interviewed all, all of these types, and it's been, it's been a real fun thing to do. I'll give you an example. A sensing, judicious entrepreneur, Bob Lowe, who is probably the premier uh, real estate developer in Los Angeles, in California, He's not intuitive. He's very hands-on, very involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the firm. But he is an entrepreneur who builds on consensus. And he's been very, very successful because he's augmented his sensing judicious style with people who have all kinds of ideas. So to close the loop on this one, you can say that intuitive people are people who are always out there trying to figure out what to do. And if everybody in the firm are intuitors, it'll be a very stimulating place to be, but not much work will get done. <laughs> and then if you're a firm where everybody are sensors, you get into the day-to-day -day humdrum, and you kind of forget the future. So that's sort of the notion of, of what this book is all about. But you've got people who are successful running companies that have both of those styles. Absolutely. Uh, and. We have also interviewed, I think, about half of the people we have interviewed are women. Um, just yesterday, I interviewed two incredible ladies. Um, they are in the spa business. And one is sensing perceptive, and the other is sensing and judicious. 
And when I met with them, I said, none of you are particularly conceptual. They just laughed because they said, absolutely, we need these crazy architects to come and help us. But here are two ladies who started 15 years ago. Both of them were school teachers. Both of them went into the spa business. And if you think about a hotel with a spa, it's sort of, for most hotels, spas are sort of loss leaders, or it's something you're supposed to have. And they've taken the whole concept of spas and totally turned it. But they've used the conceptual ideas of architects and put it into uh, in such a fashion that they are now actually making spas into profit centers for hotels, something that no, no one ever heard about. And the fun part for these ladies, they, be, they built spas in Hawaii. Uh, they built many of them on the mainland here, and they also built several spas in Europe. And, and here, here are two people who are playing off of one another in what they're really good at. And it was just fascinating to listen to them, and they will be, you know, they'll be a big part of the book. So one of them's structured and one of them's perceptive, but they're both sensing. Yes. And the structured, the structured <laughs> sensing person crosses the T's and dots the I's, take care of the books, make sure there's money in the bank, write the papers, and the sensing perceptive person who is very extroverted is sort of like a butterfly. She flutters by and people love her and she talks about the spas and gives papers and stuff and, and they've been very, very successful. And what was so fun, they said they started out, each one of them put $500 into the company and they started out and both of them are saying, we didn't know what we were going to do. And that's very much sort of a sensing way of looking at it. Because an intuitive would have all kinds of plans and strategies. They didn't. They just knew that they knew how to operate spas. And now they go, they go and register in hotels as the spa girls. That's what they call themselves. And they go into the spas, and they actually are there as a hotel guest. And they go through the whole the whole routine of a spa, and because they've learned so much, they're now able to, to design spas that are just outstanding. And there's one in Tucson that just opened up that is just absolutely incredible what they've been able to do. So that's examples of sensing people. Mm -hmm. And intuitors, what kind of businesses do they go in? They wouldn't go in the spa business necessarily. <laughs> well, I guess they, they could. But the, the, the intuitive people uh, that we have interviewed and that we're working with in the text are people who are very involved in taking an idea and bringing it into fruition. And uh, I guess one of my favorite intuitors, is if, and he's in the book, his name is John Dean. 18 months ago, he became the chief executive officer of Silicon Valley Bank. And when he took on that position, the stock sold for $8. And I saw yesterday, the, about 16 of April, 1996, the stock was worth 24. And he did that in less than 18 months. And the, where John differs from anybody is that he's totally outliving in the future. He is putting together one of the things he did when he, and I was very fortunate to work with him in the very beginning. So he has a team of 10 key people they all went through this whole exercise. They all know each other very well. And the beauty of understanding one another is simply you stop having false or wrong expectations. You know what to expect of the team players so that, so that if you take, if you take the, the, the individual who's in, in charge of the system, Dicardi, he's a sensing judicious person. So he's, you know, he's taking care of all the day-to-day -day stuff. But uh, the fellow, Jim Forrester, who is, who is the packager of loans and concepts and ideas, he's like a, so, a bar of soap, you just can't get hold of him. He's all over the place. And what he's done during this period, they've taken, you know, Silicon Valley is high tech. And he figured out that there's another business I could go into that would be just as lucrative for them as high tech. And you'll never guess what it is. It's the wine industry. And they're now financing the boutique wineries in Napa Valley and doing phenomenally well simply because they've learned to work with people who are very entrepreneurial. You know, some are entrepreneurial with chips and others are entrepreneurial with wine. 
And personally, I prefer the latter a lot better. <laughs> what happens, I mean, some people don't want to be labeled. They don't want to be known. They mm -hmm. don't want to be predictable. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to label anybody. Um, when I work with organization as a consultant, I don't run around and, and label people. I very quickly understand how they tend to function. And then I work with them on the turf that they're the best at and they're comfortable at. Uh, the, the, the whole notion of understanding that somebody tends to be more administrative than, than for an example, idealistic, is not that you put a stamp on them and say, well, this is the way they are. It's more to understand that if you deal with a person like Bob Lowe, he likes to be an administrator. He likes to put things together piece by piece by piece. Now, if you take another person who has the fastest growing I think the fastest growing investment firm in, in, in on the West Coast, Tony Spear. He is also an intuitive thinker, but he's very introverted. And he likes to be by himself. Uh, and he is the kind of guy who basically is saying, 10 months of the year, I'm not really worth very much. But two months of the year, I'm worth a lot because I'm figuring out what to do in the future. And if you take his firm, and I don't follow it that closely, but he was written up in, I think it was the Wall Street Journal just a few days ago, where he singled out as the individual who has a higher capacity to figure out what's going on in Wall Street than most people. And the stocks that he's buying in his firm are outperforming uh, the Dow Jones index and other indexes all the time. And therefore, if you look at a person like Tony, who is very conceptual, it is a, a huge mistake to accept, therefore, expect that he's also going to be a good administrator. It's almost like saying this to you, there's certain things you do well, you, me, anybody. The more we can do of that which we do well, the more successful we're going to be. And that's pretty much what the book is, 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 is all about. So there's one piece that's very interesting, because one of the things we, we say in the book is that Birds of a feather flock together, and types of a feather flock together. And you know, one of the notions in the whole book is, what do I do in order to get people to optimize their performance? And, and we're coming down very hard on people who think they have the magic of motivating people. We are pointing out very strongly, nobody can motivate anybody to do anything. The only thing you can hope to do is to create a set of conditions so people want to perform of their own free will. And now these tools will help you immensely. Because the worst thing you could say to an administrator is what? You fail to do your duty. The worst thing you can say to somebody who is very tactical is that you have no guts. The worst thing that you can say to somebody who is very strategic is that they're incompetent. And the worst thing you can say to an idealistic person is that they lack, lack human skills. And these are just little tidbits of examples of how these temperaments tend to function. What's the best thing you can say to those people? <laughs> the best thing you can say to an administrator is, I've got to tell you, without you, things wouldn't get done around here. Thank you for being responsible. Administrative types of entrepreneurs are worried they worry all the time. They come first, they work long, they leave last. And if there's nothing to worry about, now they're really worried, because they need to worry. So what you say to a tactical entrepreneur, you don't really necessarily say something, but you admire their guts. So the tactical entrepreneurs that we, we, we're working with in this text, these are people where you say, wow, how could you put all those pieces together? And the tactical entrepreneur in this book is a wonderful lady. She was a school teacher. And many years ago, she decided she wanted to be a designer, an interior designer. And now she's totally financially independent. But her great capacity was to know what to do all the time. And she's a sensing, perceiving person, so she has tremendous capacity for seeing colors and shape and form. The worst thing that you can say to somebody who's strategic, I'm a strategic person, 
And the worst thing you could say to me in my work is that I'm totally incompetent. What about the best thing? The best thing you can say is that it would appear to me you kind of know what you're talking about. Well, I forgot. Yeah, you asked me the best thing you could say as a strategist is that, you know, that was a super idea where you get that. And finally, the best thing you can say to an idealistic person is pretty obvious, isn't it? What you say to an idealistic person is, you know, I just admire the way you work so well with people. So those are the kinds of things that come out of the text. So how does this differ from manipulation? I mean, it sounds to me like these could be sincere things to say to people, but it also sounds like you can just work it. Well, the problem, if you start to manipulate people, it'll shine through. And anybody who's trying to manipulate will lose all credibility very quickly. So the point is not, man manipulation only work once or twice. It doesn't work over time. It's much more saying, saying this to you, what you learn in terms of the, these four temperaments, or these entrepreneurial temperaments, what you learn is how can I be effective with somebody who is an administrator? A large part of the book deals with exactly how someone who is an administrator can benefit from the other temperaments and vice versa. It's not a matter of manipulation at all because the basis for the whole text is obviously people end up doing what they want to do anyway. Uh, and it's very easy to sort of think that this is an other text on how you can manipulate people to do things. That's not what it is at all. It is much more to understand their realities, to understand what triggers them in terms of what they like and what they dislike to do. So how does this work as far as teams? It sounds like everybody doesn't have every skill or every talent or every whatever they need. Absolutely. They have to find people who complement them, and they yeah. tend to do what you said originally, which is birds of a feather, hire people like themselves. Yes. And you know, you, you just mentioned this team, and one of the things in America is this whole notion of team building. And, and you know, you spend lots of money on team building seminars and all that good stuff. Well. Let me tell you, there's a whole bunch of people that will never be team players. And you can send them to courses, to Timbuktu, but it'll never do it. And of these four temperaments, the people that are team players are the administrators and the people that are, are idealistic. And they're team players for different reasons. An administrator is a team player because he or she is very loyal to the organization. An idealistic person is a team player because they relate and affiliate with people. So, so that's a huge difference. Now, if you take a person who is very tactical, they will say they're team players and they're lying through their teeth. Because a tactical person, of course, is a self-propelled individual who goes out and is a heavy risk taker. And finally, a strategist is not a team player either because a strategy is so far out into the future that, a, a, that, that, that that individual seldom can have everybody follow them. And, and what, you, what you learn through working with these temperaments is that everybody can play a tremendous role if they're allowed to. I'll give you an example. Uh, four days I was in Houston, and I'm working with a, an independent oil company. And right now, oil is selling at $24. So for a time, at least, oil is very lucrative. And there was an opportunity to merge with another firm. And the, in this group of people that were negotiating was one of every one of the four temperaments. And it was so fascinating to look at how the strategic person were trying to find ways of doing the merger and how the administrator held back and how they debated. But they knew about one another and each other's temperament. And yesterday, when I talked to the, 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 the chief executive, who is an admi administrator, he said, finally, my suggestion prevailed. Ken, who was a strategist, he talked himself into doing the merger. But then he woke up during the night, and he said, it ain't going to work. And the beauty of this is that here are two people with very different orientations. But they work so well together, so when the day is over, they end up, most of the time, making very good decisions. And it's because they ended up agreeing? Yeah, or because absolutely. they came at it from two different ways? Yeah. The administrator was very critical of the opportunities. 
the, the strategist was very fascinated by the opportunities, and the, the, the administrator sort of held back, whereas the strategist was going 90 miles an hour trying to put the deal together. But when the day was over and all the pieces came together, the strategist realized, which is to his credit, that his ideas weren't good enough and didn't hold enough profit potential, so he backed out of it. There wasn't anybody in charge. There wasn't somebody watching this happening and then making a decision. No. This, you know, when people know each other this way, you don't have to worry so much about, let me put it this way, if you set up values and guiding principles, those you never change. And the values is to be open and honest, and the, the guiding principles for this particular firm is that we will always make decisions together. Nobody's going to go flying off. So that they stand there, and that's what we know they are. Then we can look at any deal, any opportunity, but we feed it into the value system, and that way we're making, this company is making very good decisions. All right. Well, our time is at an end. And I think we have a, an idea that anybody can be an entrepreneur. It's just a matter of fit and team, well, not teamwork, but <laughs> finding people who can complement yeah. the things that you don't do well. Yeah. Thank you very much for sharing that idea. Um, and the name of the book is about entrepreneurs joining the entrepreneurial elite. Yep. And uh, we've been glad to have the author with us. Thank you very much for joining us. It's been Carol Spaulding-Miner with Florida Community College and Worth Quoting. Thank you.